Welcome to a special episode of the VCCA Spotlight. I'm your host, Jim Karras. Today, we present the second episode of a two-part presentation recognizing the good work of the national presidents of the VCCA. Our guests today include Don Williams, Dave Miner, Jim Gephardt, and Franklin Gage. Each of these longtime VCCA members have served at the helm as the president of the VCCA. And today, we will have the opportunity to hear directly from each of our guests about their thoughts on serving as president. As we conclude our feature of the presidents of the VCCA, our time with today's guest is fun and entertaining. Please enjoy. Welcome to the VCCA Spotlight. I'm your host, Jim Karras. With us today is Don Williams, Dave Miner, Jim Gephardt, and Franklin Gage. I'd like to start by simply having each of you introduce yourself and tell us where you hail from, your home region in the VCCA, your time in the club, and uh, and, and then we'll take it from there. So I'll start with uh, uh, Don. So Don, tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, I, we only have an hour. <laughs> um, so yeah, let's see. I, I hail from the town of Medina, Ohio, north central Ohio, not too far south of Lake Erie, the great salt-free inland sea about which the world rotates apparently. Um, I served as president from early 2007 until early 2012, which in some mind boggling twist of fate has apparently been more than 10 years ago. Although it seems like eh, maybe 10 months, but that happens. Um, it gets worse. By the time you're as old as minor, I understand it's just a blur. So I you joined- You have to speak up so I can hear that, Mr. Don. Right, right, yeah, yeah. Uh, I joined the VCCA in July of 1972, uh, which was again with the time warp thing, 51 years ago. I was a mere, mere lad um, in a world without internet. I had to get a magazine to find out what old Chevrolets looked like. And, and, uh, and the G&D, of course, fulfilled that mission. Um, gosh, what else would you like to know? Here I sit, I'm, I'm currently deep into the rest beginnings of a restoration of a 1960 Chevrolet Biscayne. Um, and that's me with the wrenches and the dirty fingernails and occasional blood and bruises. Uh, presently at a bare frame, which has now been sandblasted, primed and painted black and barely beginning to attach some components to it with a body hanging up in the air. Uh, probably a year and a half project, but it will be brand new. Um, probably in the neighborhood of 18 months. And that will be my first car, the car I was driving in July, 1972, when I joined this auspicious organization, um, recreating the first buggy. It was a little different when I was 17, but yeah, I'll shut up. Next. Well, before we move on though, tell folks uh, where they can follow your, uh, your adventures with the 60 uh, on YouTube, because oh. I'm definitely a follower. Right, right. I Yeah, I occasionally put a video together and, and pop that up on YouTube. Um, my channel is called Dunker Don, a name that has followed me since junior high days when I was tall and skinny and could push a basketball down through the hoop from above. There was a brief period when that was possible. There may have been a trampoline involved. I'm not sure. Um, Dunker Don on on uh, YouTube, yes, but I, I post each time there's a meaningful uh, threshold or event or step forward on the restoration. I posted on Facebook, and I've gradually figured I don't really care for Facebook. I don't care for how you have to format things like this. But if somebody really wanted to try to make sense out of this particular restoration. They go to my primary, what we call it, homepage, I guess, and go back backwards in time until about uh, January is when I got started with it. And then just follow upward, you'll find the occasional silly posting about some other topic. But each time something happens on the 1960 Chevy, uh, I, I do make a post with photos and an occasional video reference back to the YouTube channel. Um, 
which is fun. It, it helps keep me, you know, it gives me a linear record that I can go back and see what I did. And of course, I have thousands of photos on my phone. It's the most important tool in a restoration of the 21st century, I think. Um, having fun. That's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. So next is uh, Dave Miner. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Dave. Well, I followed the presidency of Don Williams. Uh, Don was president during uh, the 50th anniversary of the VCCA when we were in Flint, Michigan. And uh, so that means if Don went till 2011, I started in 2012 and I served for three years. Um, I joined the VCCA in 1989. I'm a newcomer to the club. I um, owned my first Chevrolet in 1968, which was a 1940 Chevrolet business coupe. And it went from being a highly modified high school car to get me from point A to point B to uh, preservation. Um, and I drove that car for 54 years. And there is some rumor that I might have sold it recently. I'm an active member of Lake Erie, Ohio region. I'm a tech advisor for the tools that come in the trunk of all Chevrolets or the back seat or under the seat or depending what model you have up through 1948. And then they became optional from 49 through the fall, uh, they quit selling them in the fall of 1966 or 1967, I believe they quit selling the tools. Um, I was a chairman I for- I apologize most sincerely. I was looking at a 2023 Traverse online, just goofing around. I'm not about to buy one anytime soon, but they now have an option of a toolkit. On the oh 2023, and it includes like a socket set. I'm sure it's metric, and and other tools in a pouch. I was fascinated by that option. You should explore. Well, I'll tell you what. Buy one of those for me, Don. And I'll add it to my collection. It's done. Okay. Uh, in 2011, I was the chairman of the 50th anniversary when we all met in uh, Flint, Michigan. Um, we actually had a total attendance of 1,625 VCCA members and their families attend that, which was pretty spectacular. Um, then in 2016, I worked with uh, our webmaster for many, many, many years. He since has retired, but Bill Barker. And we set up the location for uh, Lake Tahoe uh, Bill had an insight and some uh, uh, some previous information on car events in Lake Tahoe. So I worked with Bill and then I'm not so sure why, but then I was back at it in Bowling Green, which was our 60th anniversary meet. And that was scheduled for 2021 and along came a thing called a tornado, which uh, destroyed 500 homes in town and destroyed <laughs> the biggest part of the uh, road course and the judging field area where we were scheduled and COVID and everything else, all that stuff happened. COVID was the first thing and, and we, we uh, postponed it one year and I think it was a big success and I'm, that's about it. Well, thank you so much. Um, really, uh, it's fascinating. Um, to hear kind of everybody talk about, you know, the things that that were important to them during the early um, times when they in the club and over the club. Um, next, we'll move on to Jim Gephardt. Uh, Jim, tell us a little bit about yourself and your time in service. Well, I'm uh, I'm in Roswell, Georgia, which is about uh, 20 miles north of Atlanta. And uh, we've been here since 76. I grew up in New Jersey. And I originally joined in 1971, and I was a member from 71 to 76, and uh, a, a, a long-term member, Bill Wendelar, recruited me in, uh, in New Jersey. I had a 48 Chevy at the time, which had just qualified to be uh, part of the club, so that's how I got started. 
but I realized pretty quickly that I was more a 55 through 57 guy at that period of time, and they were not recognized and wouldn't be for seven years. So I, I dropped that, joined uh, uh, the Classic Chevy Club International, and I rejoined in 2002, and I'm a life member. Uh, was on the board from 2009 to 2019, and I need to thank or blame Don Williams for that activity uh, because I was uh, asked to step in for our area director who had, had been very, very ill. And I was president from uh, 2017 to 2019. So uh, we had... Uh, in the Southeast region, Area 9, uh, there's seven southeastern states, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Georgia, Florida, Louisiana, and Mississippi. And, uh, and currently, director again of the heart of Georgia region, which is where I started on this um, activity. Um, had a number of, of things that happened during the time I was on the board, and, and we, we'll get into that later. But I'm still pretty active, uh, presently restoring a couple cars. Um, I just recently acquired a 57 Corvette car that I've wanted since I was six when they first came out, six or seven years old. Uh, I found it, and there's going to be an article in the G&D on it. I found it about uh, 10 miles from here in a garage where it had been sitting for 35 years, which is kind of neat. And there's surprising that there's any of those left out there. Engine's been changed, so I've got a get that right, but it was a 2-4 car with a four-speed light, light car. And uh, I've also got another 55 Nomad that's uh, unrestored turquoise and white uh, 265 automatic that I'm working on at the same time. But I don't have a YouTube set up on it, and uh, I can probably put some pictures up. And you might see something on our dealership website, which is californiacarco.com. Still an antique car dealer. In my 22nd year, we've sold a thousand cars and trucks, every one with the original engine, and that's not something that very many old car dealers can say. Um, we're still that way. I won't even look at a car unless it's got the original drivetrain. I'm still designing dealerships. Uh, I've done 25,000 of them since uh, 1985, and we're currently doing uh, Volvo and Mack truck dealerships in U.S., Canada, and Mexico. And we started a program with uh, Peterbilt about three and a half years ago. We developed an image program and we're doing their stores in U.S. and Canada now. So, uh, plus we have a body shop. So with three companies and 74, I'm pretty busy and uh, don't, don't get a chance to get bored. I'm talking to you from the office at the dealership and I work uh, half days. I'm only here from eight to eight during the week. And on uh, Saturdays from nine to six. So a lot of hours, but you know, if it's your own business, it doesn't feel like it's work. And I get a chance to play with my own cars while I'm here. So that gives you a little, little update. Thank you for that, Jim. And uh, Franklin, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm probably the most accidental member here. Um, never occurred to me to be a car collector, but I never had a new car, never had any interest in any. My mother bought a 1951 Chevy well before I was born. My father trained her well. She kept it for 20 years. Fast forward, I was reading the Washington Post in 1997 and saw an ad for one and just for nostalgia's sake, went to look at it and felt a little embarrassed at having taken the owner's time without any intention of buying it. So offered him half the asking price and it turned out the wife wanted it gone, so it ended up in my garage. I found VCCA also somewhat accidentally when I was getting gas in the 51 the first time, and someone came up and handed me a g and I joined that day, and that was in 1997, and here we are 27 or so years later. Um, I belong to every region in my area at one point. Um, unfortunately, the number of regions has shrunk, but I continue to do whatever I can with each region to make a go of it. I regretted that I joined in 1997 and 1996 because the 
anniversary meet was in South Dakota that year, and I would like to have been there. So I'm so glad that we're going there for the next one. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, let me ask uh, each of you as we uh, kind of move on. Tell uh, we'll start with Don. I think Don's getting set up. Start with uh, your time as uh, president and kind of what were some of the stuff going on while you were at the helm. Wow. Um, that what by the way what you see there i was turning on my phone to join the meeting via my phone too just as a backup because this antique desktop is uh antique um it was a tumultuous time it was a dark and rainy night um 2007 we were the organization, the Vintage Chevrolet Club, in many ways was at its zenith membership wise. We, we were uh, oh, approaching 9,000 active members. Uh, times were good. Many of those members had been members since the 1960s and 70s um, and were still young and active and engaged, as, as it were. Uh, it, it was a world where we were just coming out of the period that everyone drove their 1933 uh, car to the meet in their area without a lot of thought. Uh, trailers and tow vehicles were becoming more and more common, but we still actually drove these cars as if they were cars. And, um, and it was good. I was just a kid, let's see, 2007, I must have been about 53 or four, something like that. Um, and, and we had a, uh, an organization that resided primarily in Southern California at the business of Gene and Dennis Fink. They had been, this is not negative or positive, simply reporting uh, what was the situation. They had been the editors of the GND magazine for decades. Uh, they had alternately served on the national board from time to time and were prime movers and spark plugs of the organization, which we all should remember was primarily a Southern California organization at its beginning in 1961 and through the end of the mid 60s. It was very much a California organization with satellite members in those other 49 states. Um, which of course has all dramatically changed. And the, oh, let's talk about the database of membership. That was a huge issue back when I first took the big chair there. Um, and it was on index cards in pencil or ink in some cases with a wonderful gal who had been the membership secretary for decades in a roll top desk at her house. I saw that roll top desk. I saw those index cards and there was, um, an embryonic electronic version of that that resided in a primitive computer at the Fink printing business because they needed it to produce labels so we could mail that GND to everyone each month. Uh, the GND, by the way, was a black and white publication with a, a color cover. Um, and it all worked just fine. And there were, of course, politics and personalities involved in anything that's a transition like that. And we survived all those things. But the probably biggest event, I guess, during the five years, which I'm pretty sure I was president longer than anyone else in our 62 year history. I'm, I'm not sure if that's good, bad, or how that came to happen. Um, yeah, you're the Roosevelt of the VCCA. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. You were president five years, which yes, you're right, Don. Yeah, it was a long five. Uh, <laughs> But uh, we transitioned from that roll top desk and index cards to a, a modern real time database that exists electronically on the uh, internet. People can join now on their phone or computer, instantaneously become a member. Uh, we can access that database to generate mailing lists for the magazine or whatever other purpose. Of course, there's even just a purely electronic membership uh, opportunity now. Um, so it was kind of the coming of age. Welcome to the 21st century. A lot of turmoil, a lot of work 
to make that transition. And we also transitioned away from the long, long, long standing relationship with Fink Printing into, uh, shall we say, a modern printing business that, that creates and mails the, the magazine in full color uh, very recently, as everyone knows, of course. So yeah, it, it was a huge uh, technology sea change during the time that I was there. And I guess uh, culminating, as Dave mentioned, with the, uh, the 50th anniversary meet in Flint, which was uh, quite a gala extravaganza, a cornucopia of Chevrolet ecstasy, as it were. And, and then Dave. Oop, lost I think we lost I Don. With. Huh? There he goes. Well, you froze for just a minute, oh. but you're back now. Oh, okay, I, I was just simply saying, I also bought the gavel, which all of you there that have subsequently uh, chaired this august body uh, have hammered on the table with, uh, there was no gavel. I thought that was a horrible omission. So I went and bought a gavel, got it engraved with BCCA board or something of that effect. So hopefully you've hammered it well. Um, so that, that, that was my, uh, my big deal, I guess. Well, thank you so much for that. Uh, Dave, um, talk about following Don and, and the stuff that was uh, happening during your time. Well, you don't follow on stage children or pets. And so that's like, uh, uh, you don't follow Don, uh, Don is Don. So uh, yes, I was the president after Don, and uh, I will say that uh, thanks, Don, for a lot of the um, uh, heads up background information and guidance uh, that you gave to the board and to me. And I say that sincerely. Um, one of my first tasks um, during my presidency um, was to evaluate and, and write a contract for the um, 2016 anniversary meet. I was, uh, I began my presidency six months after I was done being the meet chairman at Flint in 2011. And a board member had selected Medford, Oregon as um, a site for 2016. And since I had done a lot of the background work and being the meet chairman for Flint, I volunteered to write a contract for um, the venue out there. Um, and what I soon found out was that the venue included um, a convention center which was um, the local armory. Um, and they were, because they're a government agency, they were unwilling to write any language which would include the fact that we could actually use it when the time came. Um, in other words, if, if, a, uh, if a fire in Oregon occurred in 2016, um, it would, they would stage everybody out of this armory in Medford and they could cancel our contract up to three minutes before we got there. So consequently, I shared all this with the board. The board did make a site visit. It became clear to all of us that that was not um, an ideal case. Uh, it, um, that we needed to know with a window of two or three years that in advance they were gonna cancel, not two or three minutes. Um, so any flood, any fire, anything, they could just say, sorry, we've, we've got to use this facility. So the board decided that uh, Bill Barker and I would um, investigate Lake Tahoe. Um, so we went to Lake Tahoe and we did, um, a lot of looking for trailer parking, um, showroom, 
the hotels was not a problem. Lake Tahoe is full of casinos that have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rooms. So that part wasn't a problem, but setting up all the logistics since they're not known as a car culture, they're known as gaming and they're known as skiing and winter sports. Um, so that was the first challenge that I came across. And, the, and I did find that the board was um, extremely open and willing to take a decision that they had made, i.e. we're going to Medford, Oregon, and take a look at the facts, go out there. We held a, a board meeting out there and, and uh, shake our heads and then say, no, this is not what we need as a vintage Chevrolet club. So that would have been the first thing. And that, that went on for many, many, many months as you're canceling one venue out, Medford, and you're trying to develop another one uh, because time is clicking away. The second thing that really comes to mind for me is that um, as I, before I became president, I had a personal habit of going through all of the new members that were joining the VCCA. And obviously if they were related geographically to uh, my region, it was, um, it, it was easy to give a phone call and say, hey, you know, we have a local region here. If they happened to own a 1940 Chevrolet, it was also real easy to call up and say, well, I own a 40 Chevrolet too. What do you have? And to start that conversation. And so I ended up meeting a lot of new members that way. But more important than that, although that's very important, I spent three years recording on a chart what percentage of our membership joined in what we call the four cylinder era, which is up through 1928. And what percentage of new members listed a car and that was in the six cylinder era, which we list as 1929 through 1954. And what percentage obviously have 55 and up. And I ran this data without telling anybody, it was just a personal thing I was doing on my, and I was charting all of this, and it's it, it became almost a non-wavering pattern. It stayed for a long, for those three years, it stayed at 7% were joining with cars 1928 and older, and it varied a little bit, but the six cylinder era was in the 46% range. And in the uh, eight cylinder area, it was in the 46, 47% range. And those ranges, those, those two numbers kind of floated two or three or 4% over the three years, but they stayed in that ballpark. And so I took a look, I presented that to the board and I took a look at um, the, the fact of what we were actually producing in the GND. We started, uh, and you old timers like uh, Don and a few others will remember that I believe the, the, the big number that's remembered by everybody, I believe, is 1911 through 1942. And so um, that's kind of how we began. And then as years go on, we, we, we changed that. And obviously now we, we encourage all kinds of years to be part of the club. But I got to thinking that um, those that are reading the magazine, um, it, what are they seeing in our magazine? And, and at one point during my presidency, we went more than half a year and we never featured, showed, displayed. I'm not saying a car wasn't for sale in the back. On the cover, nothing in the magazine was newer than 1936. So 
those individuals that joined the club, the, that 47% that joined the club that had a 1955 and newer car. They, they come to the vintage Chevrolet club and they've got their 55 210 with a 265 in it. And they're all excited to join us. And for more than half of their first year of their membership, everything they saw was a 490, a baby grand, 31 coupe, whatever. It, it, nothing was newer than 1936. And as I looked at that list of people that were joining, they were joining with Cavaliers, Citations, Vegas, Novas, Malibus, Chevelles, Caprices, all, uh, Monte Carlos, all those kind of Chevrolets were not being featured at all in the G&D. And so I consider um, one of the more important things that I did during my presidency was to encourage us to take a look at our audience and, and not uh, definitely not forget the foundation of our audience. Um, the 490s, the Model Ds, the uh, FBs, all the early stuff, the, the light sixes, the classic sixes, um, all the important cars that started this whole process were still important. I, I wasn't trying to say we should not feature those kind of articles. But I felt very strongly that that sh should not be our total diet. So to me, those were the, the two things that happened during my presidency that I um, enjoyed working on. Thank you for that. Um, that's actually interesting. You know, I, I kind of remember a little bit about the, the change in the G&D and those discussions. And, um, and, you know, it is interesting. That's probably something that pe most members were unaware of, but probably made a huge impact uh, to um, members in the club. So thank you for I that. I think the current members weren't aware of it because that was our diet and that was our focus as a club. I think to me, where the, where the importance lies in all of that is that individual that joined our club and he was so proud of his 1981 Camaro and he joins the club and then there is not one article or anything that would speak to a Camaro uh, for much of the year. And I think that those are the folks that hopefully we've helped to attract uh, because if you look at, and I still look at the new members, believe it or not, and kind of peruse through and see what percentage are, are joining at what. I don't keep a big chart anymore, but uh, we obviously have a lot of folks that are joining with the various models that, that I previously, previously just mentioned. Thank you, Jim. How about uh, the time during your presidency? What, was, uh, what were the things on your mind? Well, I, I kind of came in at a uh, um, difficult time um, within the uh, in the organization. We had uh, just lost an editor and a creative director, and that was one of the first things that was impacting what was going on. And uh, we had to establish a new creative staff, and we had a new editor, and that editor didn't last my entire term. We had to replace that editor. And uh, Franklin was uh, very important in helping us find the editor that we currently have through his contacts with uh, the Cadillac Club. So that was a, that was a big deal. Uh, we also had member services retiring, which was another big deal. Uh, how are we going to find somebody that can do what they could do and, and help uh, be more uh, responsive to customers. And uh, again, Franklin came up with some names and we wound up with somebody that could be helpful with with that. So those were, you know, took some time to get things worked out. Uh, during my time on the board and, and then uh, presidency, we added GMC to uh, the VCCA and uh, Dave supported that, which was appreciated. Uh, probably the most controversial thing was we founded the personalization 
Chevrolet chapter at PCC, and uh, it it took a lot of work and a lot of revisions to get the motion through. Um, but it has brought a different set of people into it. And if you look at the GND now, uh, even the current issue, you'll find a couple PCC vehicles in there. You have to look a little bit because they're careful about the photographs that they put in, but they're in there. Um, we uh, financially supported the members of the Paradise Fire. You may remember that it was, uh, now we have fires everywhere, but we didn't have as many fires then. And uh, a number of our members lost their cars or their homes and, and it was a big thing. And, and I think uh, that was a, a good thing to do. We founded the Vintage Chevrolet Heritage Foundation to financially support the VCCA with an IRS qualified donation procedure, which the VCCA did not have. And uh, that has brought money to the, to the organization. As a matter of fact, uh, there's a discussion going on uh, that the Vintage Chevrolet Heritage Foundation may help pay for the color copies of the magazine. So we're also paying right now for half of the library fees with the AACA, and we'll step up and pay for all of them soon. Uh, we have about $100,000, a little over $100,000 in there. We expect that to be at least one hundred and fifty dollars by the end of the year. Um, and we talked about and started um, looking at a redesign for the VCCA logo, which again, building a little bit on what Dave was talking about, um, when you look at the image of the VCCA and you only can see a 1914 or 1912 or whatever it was, kind of a, a design on there, that didn't attract anybody that was into more than four cylinder cars. So. Uh, we were looking at different ways to handle that. And uh, that was carried on after I left um, by uh, Franklin. So those were some of the things that we were involved in. So a whole lot of things going on over those three years. And uh, I was proud to be part of it. And uh, it was challenging for a while. Uh, just and a few phone calls, a couple emails would be a piece of cake. <laughs> yes, yeah, so well, like recruited me. Hey, it's no big deal. You just come and you take credit for everybody else's work and it's not a hard thing to do. Well, it was a little more difficult than that, but anyway, it was a it was a great opportunity. Perhaps okay. I glossed over a few of the details. Yeah, probably. just a couple, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Jim. And Franklin, uh, you uh, took up the torch uh, from Jim. Talk about your time at the helm. Well, of course, we ended up with a worldwide uh, pandemic, so there were challenges associated with that, but we came through it. I will be honest to say I regret that VCCA continued to shrink during my presidency, not catastrophically yet, but uh, I would like to have seen it gone the other way, have gone the other way. But we did some things to try to make it appeal to as many people as possible. Uh, David was talking about the uh, content of the G&D. Uh, you'll notice now that we mostly, most issues have a variety of cars in. What instigated that was, you, some may recall that uh, a prior editor, uh, Pete Phillips, did a very nice issue on 1914 Chevys. The whole issue was devoted to 1914 two responses in succession came in from members same day. One was, thank goodness you're finally again focusing on 1914 and that era Chevrolets. I was going to quit, but now I'll keep my membership. The next one was, I like old cars, but not that old. I will not be renewing. So I know that there is no way to please everyone, but I think we need to try to please as many as possible. And that's what I tried to do. Um, the one thing that I was happy to have, I can't remember what, I think it may have passed before I was president. I introduced the idea of having an electronic membership for domestic members. We, uh, previously only had it available for international members. And I understood the concern. And in fact, I shared it that if we had a domestic electronic membership available, 
there might be a rush to it and then it would become very expensive to produce only a few paper GNDs. And we certainly didn't want to diss our paper members. Um, I watched other clubs that did not happen. The motion passed by one vote. And for several years now, the only area of membership that's been growing is our electronic members. Um, it doesn't, it's not enough to counteract the slippage in the paper. Uh, Don and I had some correspondence while he was president, I think, or maybe when Dave was president, that the culture has changed. We are now confronted by younger people who have less interest in cars than we probably did, who view them as appliances. I think that was the term Don used. Uh, we can't change that reality, but I remain convinced because I mostly drive my old Chevys that just the response of people when I stop for gas or stop at a store or wherever, uh, there are plenty of Chevrolet enthusiasts out there and we simply need to find them. I am the last person to know how to do it because I'm so backward, but I think there are a lot of opportunities on the web to do that. And I hope someone smarter than me finds a way. Thank you so much. It, you know, it really is um, fascinating to hear each of your time. And, and you know, I, I, I just, the comments that each of you have made about those things are uh, um, just, just astounding to me that, you know, Don talking about transitioning from a, a black and white paper to now a newsletter to now a full color newsletter in May. Um, sure been a lot of change and and managing change is never easy and you all did it with such grace during your tenure at the helm let's shift gears a little bit and talk about uh this is kind of fun um the difference of serving as an area director on the board so a board member versus being a uh the guy that holds the gavel and 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 talk with the idea of of uh, someone, maybe a, a region director that's thinking about running for area director and kind of the, the time at being a board and, and your take on that. We'll start with Don. Well, I, I guess um, I'm a dinosaur in some regards, although obviously I'm the youngest one in this little group. Um, nice, very nice, <laughs> appreciate that. Fight me. <laughs> um, but not the wisest, Don. Right. No, no, God, no. Um, I was never an area director. I, <laughs> I was elected to the board, oh, about 1917, as what we used to call a member at large. Mm -hmm. uh, and I always preferred to think of it as I was more of a senator than a mere representative. I represented the entire United States as a member at large and, and, and Norway and Australia as well, um, and Canada. So, you know, it was a different thing. I've certainly had the opportunity to observe dozens of area directors before, during, and after that time period. Um, you know, going to the national level from being an area director is, it's actually kind of a step down in activity. Just ask Mr. Gebhardt. An area director is busy. There are actually job duties that have to be attended to in, in uh, local regions. I always thought regions was a stupid name that we call our local chapters. Nobody understands that. That's a, a remnant of the 60s, by the way, when the idea was that there would be regions, each of which would include several chapters. Um, and that happened a few times, again, mostly in Southern Cali. But... Uh, we, we've devolved into a place for the last 50 years or so, we've referred to our local chapters as regions, which confuses people. But that's that's uh, a digression. First time I ever digressed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, as, as you go to the national level, it mostly, <laughs> aside from, that's kind of an inside joke, I, when Jim stepped up to, to take Fred Baumgartner's spot, um, I was telling him, yeah, it's no big deal. You know, you just show up to a meeting once a year, get a paid vacation, basically. We talk a little bit, you get a few emails, a few phone calls, it's a piece of cake. And, and he believed me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I was very gullible then. Yeah, yeah. I, I never got one of those paid vacations, Don. 
No. Well, no, you were the exception. We were trying to discourage you from showing up. I think probably there was a brief period when the five of us that are in this conversation were all on the board together. Uh, certainly have been at board meetings where each of us was present. And um, we, you know, as we transition from area to national, it's largely the same functions, except you're no longer focused just obviously geographically on your home base. Your homies can take care of themselves. There's a new area director and, and you're on the national level considering the same kinds of, it's tremendously rewarding to, to both serve as an area director. Um, it's good for your ego. You, you make new friends that will remain lifetime friends. Look at everybody on the screen of my computer right now, each and every one of you, uh, we know each other and, and have been associated for decades because of our willingness to, to, uh, to play the game and jump in as an area level or even as a region director, a chapter director, if you will. A lot of fun there. I'm, I'm back to being an assistant director uh, in, in my little local region, which I'm not sure I'm fully qualified for, but I, I'm you know holding it down at this point. And it's, it's just fun it, it, to be engaged. It, sometimes it makes you groan because you have to do a minute of work, um, but the rewards far out exceed that little bit of effort. Dave, can you, can you add anything to that? I think for me, the biggest difference, challenge, or thinking that I had to utilize between an area, I was area seven director, um, later to become, we split, seven became so huge that we split it between A and B. But the presidency, your view is broader and bigger. And so as I'm in Ohio, we have a tendency at our, at our various um, gatherings, whether it's a central meet or, or whatever we're doing each year, we have a tendency to value class judging at a very high level with a lot of seriousness, a lot of folks that are skilled in judging, et cetera, et cetera. And, and as I became president and I'm interacting with people in area one, two, and three, or, or some of the other areas, um, the interest in actual vehicle judging was not at the same fever pitch that it was in Ohio and Michigan and Indiana. And so there, there has to be a, a thinking process where you're um, understanding how other people view the VCCA and, and many areas in our country, driving of the vehicle is the number one thing that you do. Not is the upper radiator hose the correct one for a 1971 Impala. Um, and so consequently, I think that um, was one of my bigger challenges <laughs> Uh, between sitting in the chair of the presidency and being an area director that um, I, that kind of focused within 500 miles of my home, so to speak. Thank you. And uh, Jim, you uh, uh, you also are are uh, one that's done done quite a few, worn many hats in the VCCA, from a region director, committee chair, uh, area director, and president. Um, uh, what can you add to uh, what Don and Dave have already said? I kind of agree with Don a little bit there. The, the area director, there's a lot of responsibility um, on a regional director and an area director, um, especially when it comes to the area meet. And, uh, you know, if you're going to be involved in putting that meet together, um, your reputation and the reputation of your whole area hangs on how well that single event every year, uh, at least in, in our area, uh, comes off. So we spent a lot of time, and Don and, and Dave um, and Franklin, uh, you've all come to our meets, and uh, I think we've 
did a pretty good job with a lot of those meets. We moved them around. We had lots of activities, uh, maybe more activities than we needed to have. But uh, we have planes, trains, and automobiles. We tried to have those in almost every meet. Uh, we had car collections to see, railroad stuff, railroad train rides. We had uh, drive-in movies. You know, we had a lot of stuff going on. And we tried to make them very memorable. And we had a lot of compliments on, on how they worked out. But it took a year or two to organize it. So it was a really big deal. Um, and you have to coordinate a lot with the other uh, regional directors in your area to make that happen because we moved it around to all the different different regions that we had. So that was that was a lot of responsibility. And so when Don asked me to um, come to Oregon, that was a surprise. And uh, I was disappointed that we couldn't find a place, honestly, in Oregon to be able to have our uh, board meeting because it looked like a really neat place. Uh, but there just wasn't any place that would handle the size that we needed to have. I didn't know all the ins and outs of the contract arrangement, but I think you did a great job going to uh, Lake Tahoe. But the difference between being an area director, and you do have responsibilities, you've got to, uh, you've got to do your reports. And I tried to standardize that and we, we made more of it. It wasn't, it wasn't a vacation, Don. It was more work than you think. It was a lot of work putting the board meetings together, and it was a lot of work getting the board members to do their due diligence and complete their reports and stuff like that. But uh, when you're president, it's like being the captain of a ship. There's a whole lot of moving parts and a whole lot of people involved in doing a whole lot of things that, that make the BCCA work. Um, and it's very difficult to get all those people going in the same direction. Um, and making a change, it's kind of like turning a ship. It takes a long time sometimes to get things done. Um, but it's worth the effort. And it, it definitely was a highlight, uh, one of the highlights of my life being able to do that. So there's my two cents. Franklin. You asked about the difference between being a region director and an area director and president. I was only the director of a region for a couple of years. And that circumstance was that the region was failing. There was a board meeting, I was on the board and they wanted to shut the region down. There was a majority to shut it down. And the only way they would keep it going was if I agreed to be director, even though I was the longest distance member. And I sort of have a stubborn streak through me and I didn't want to see it go away. So I agreed, even though it was a burden at the time. And I'm not saying it's necessarily because of much that I did, but the timing was right. The region was still there. A new generation joined. It's now become the strongest region in our area, I think it's safe to say. Um, so I, I think it's rewarding to be an area director. And maybe it's because I tend to be slow at everything. I spent just as much time almost as an area director as when I was a board member and as I was president of BCCA has sort of become my magnificent obsession. Um, so I, I've kind of been joking with people who now realize that I am no longer the president. And I say, well, I'm very happy to be able to have the option to say, that's Roger's problem, go call him but I still enjoy helping making the club go. So I would encourage anyone, not necessarily an area director, but any member of BCCA to step forward. We, it's, it, I don't think it's much of a secret. We have, to, we have to beg people to run for the board. And I would like, I, I would hope that in the future there would be some more interest in that and Maybe we'll attract some more younger people. If you look at our board, we look pretty monolithic. Thank you so much for that. Uh, shifting gears here a little bit. Um, let's talk about current uh, status of the VCCA. Um, what, do you, uh, what do you see for the VCCA today? And, and what do you hope for the club in the future? Um, Don. While we've been sitting here, I've received an email from a member uh, long, long time member asking if we still had oil cans for the Model H chapter 
which really means Dan O'Day in, in San Jose, California, uh, organized making those. I, I got a chance to stop and visit with Dan in San Jose a couple years ago. Um, we haven't done that for five or six years, but the email comes to me. I have no idea why. And I'm perfectly happy to get it. And I forwarded it to Dan. I, it's already given an answer. Like, yes, I still have a handful of those for sale, but the price is up because the shipping costs. Da, 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 da. That's happened during this meeting. Another thing that's happened during this meeting, probably happened to Dave too, um, is I've gotten an email from one of the proofreaders of the G&D. Each month we get the G&D electronically to study it and, and um, make sure there aren't any insidious Pontiacs trying to sneak their way through the into the covers. Um, proof for typos and so forth. That has come in during this meeting. So uh, it's been 10 years plus since I left the big chair and, and yet still it remains an active part of my life. Um, where does it go into the future? You know, God knows. I, I, I certainly don't want to be a, a negative person. I think inevitably, if we're realistic and pragmatic, 100 years from now, the antique car hobby will not exist, or it certainly won't be anything remotely recognizable to what we've enjoyed, simply because the concept of large metal machines that burn uh, gasoline and travel around at a mile a minute on massive concrete structures will no longer exist. Uh, the Star Trek world is coming, uh, kicking and screaming sometimes, slowly sometimes, but the reality is the human beings who enjoyed these machines as we all were privileged and blessed to do during their absolute heyday. There can be no denying that the heyday of the automobile was from World War II until the early 1970s, in my opinion. And, and those of us who were growing up and engaged during that period are very, very lucky because it was magical. It's absolutely magical. It defined the meaning of Western civilization and modern man for a couple of decades there. And we are moving past that. Teenagers today don't bother to get a driver's license. It's not relevant to them. Go look at the statistics. The average age of a first driver's license when we were kids was 16 years and one day. Now it's past 20. They don't care. They don't need a driver's license. They call Uber, jump on mass transit, or simply do it from home. Um, the appliance concept, Franklin, that we spoke about recently, or a while back, I guess, um, it, it's real. Automobiles are no longer something that have a personality, that become a part of the family, that you have to work on daily or weekly in order to be able to move around. That's all evolving into the past. And therefore, though, those of us who worship at the altar of vintage iron, um, we will eventually age out. There will no longer be millions of people that have those memories, only thousands and then hundreds and eventually none. And that's okay. This is our time. It, it's a period that um, we, as I said, we're blessed to live through and participate in. Um, and the day will come just like we don't have great clubs for horse drawn vehicles or Eh, steam locomotives hardly count because they're simply too big, expensive, and complicated. But those days passed, and our day too will pass. Again, not to be negative, it's just simply reality. Anyone care to add to that? My only caution would be that I, I can't say anything Don said is wrong, but except that there will be some exceptions to the rule. So there, there are clubs now that have an interest in steam locomotives of course so we we may we may shrink from our nadir but uh may i i'm just a little cautious because i remember in elementary school being told by more than one teacher that i was going to be part of the jetson generation and the cars would be obsolete by now and that hasn't happened so I'm skeptical of any future casting, even by the esteemed Mr. Williams. <laughs> I, uh, I, I think we've got a lot of air left in the tires. And uh, a, a good example, I think, is that uh, there's some younger members of the BCCA are starting to develop new thinking. And I think we need some new thinking. A good example is the uh, 1949 to 54 chapter. And yeah. uh, we've got a motivated young guy, okay, didn't agree with everybody. There's, you know, and that kind of thing happens. 
Um, but I think he's he's honed in on a group that's pretty interested in, in doing that. And I could see a Nova chapter without any problem at all. And I could see uh, 64 to 70 Chevelle chapter, which is now getting another little section in there, except, Amen. For, you, except for you. Uh, <laughs> and an El Camino chapter, I think there's a following for those, those vehicles. Uh, and even a five through seven thing, it could happen. And I, I'm, I'm starting to see maybe through this 49 through 54 thing that there's maybe some strength in smaller groups. So I, I think that's good. It's hard to that's be exactly what we were thinking about years and years ago when we created the non-geographic right. chapter. Right. And right. we talked about a Nova chapter specifically 15 years ago. Um, and I, let me throw out one last caveat. I did say a century from now. Not yeah. Oh, thank you. Oh, I thought it was next week. Yeah, none of um, us will be here for that, so we don't have to worry about it. But okay. I, to me, I think in the meantime and, and long term, who's got that crystal ball and, and a clear one? I don't. Um, although I think some of the ideas and thoughts that Don threw out possibly are going to happen or probably. But I think one of the things short term is I think that you have seen or we have seen the VCCA make some adaptations. For example, 30 years ago, many of the meets, for example, a central meet or a Southwest meet or whatever, were long drawn out events. It was a family event. It went for five, six, seven days. And the cars were part of it, but also the relationships were part of it. And what I've seen over the past 10 years is many of those events are now one day shorter or two days shorter. There's discussion on uh, for the next um, uh, anniversary meet, which uh, uh, will be held possibly out west in Rapid City. But there's there's a lot of discussion as far as making that event a day or so shorter so that those folks that are still employed, um, hard to get away, uh, they need travel time to get to these places, can still enjoy the VCCA. So short term, I see us doing more driving tours and having shorter events like judging meets. Uh, where you don't have to be there for four days to get your car judged. You can show up the day before and then have your car judged and, and still participate in the VCCA. I think that's a trend that we're moving in. And then to all of you, um, what, what advice would you give uh, VCCA members that uh, want to get more involved on how they can do it? What are some of the things they could do to become more involved in the club? Join the chat site. Going to region right away. Going and, and definitely, if you're close enough, my region's an hour away, but I still go to it every month. And and the friendships that you develop are lifelong. And if you don't have a membership, or excuse me, if you don't have a region that you think is close enough, start one. Um, it only takes six members. That could be three couples. And we've had as Dave and, and Don should especially be aware of, we had a great success with that Western Buckeye region where one spark plug started that club and it now is doing an annual show. They hosted a central meet that was very successful. Um, I, one of my surprises when I was uh, contacting members who hadn't renewed and asked them why uh, they would say there was no region in their area. And that meant that it wasn't within 20 miles. So uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity to start new small regions. And that's where you will probably find most of your new members who are going to be interested in going to local activities more than traveling to Tahoe or South Dakota or Chattanooga or all the wonderful places we've chosen to go, but that's a limited audience. It's a responsibility of the area director to start regions. I did three. I tried to start a fourth, but I got three. 
two are still viable. The other one, eh, you know, but uh, it's not hard. In fact, I would still be willing to help somebody start a region. It's, it's really not as hard. You got to have the spark plug person. If you don't have the spark plug person with boots on the ground in the middle of it, it's not going to happen because you can't fly in and start a region. You know, you've got to, it's got to be somebody right there. Exactly. But, Bob Tennyson could do that. Yeah. But I'd, I'd be happy to uh, help people start regions. I enjoyed doing that. It was a lot of fun. I made it a requirement. You started the region within three years, you had to have the area meet there. And that worked. It really worked. We've had an area meet in each one of those regions and then uh, they were nice meets. So anyway, I'm I'm available if that uh, is something that people need help with. As we wrap it up, any final comments from anyone? I just want to say, Jim, thanks for putting this all together. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, a great deal. And uh, now we're recorded for all posterity to sit and marvel. Good, good show. <laughs> and it would never be the same without Don. Absolutely. Right, right. We've had <laughs> He's speechless. Fun. I think on that you end it. Yeah. yeah. We, hey, Franklin, any last fun. words? We're still having fun. Thank you for getting us together. Um, I guess my last word would be the same as I may have started with. I think I am a, a I'm cautiously optimistic that we can at least survive if not grow, because I think there is plenty of interest out there despite all the, the metrics that make it a steeper climb than maybe it was for the last 50 years. I would say we all appreciate the privilege to have been the president. Here, here. Absolutely. Well, thanks to each of you for your time of service um, as president and all the things you've done to the uh, uh, for the club over the years in your areas and uh, on the national level uh, and the very local level. Um, it's been a pleasure today. I've enjoyed uh, my friendships with each of you over the years that I've been involved and you've all certainly set as uh, the goalposts for those behind you. Thank you so much so with that. Thank you. And to everyone listening, Appreciate your time with us today on the VCCA Spotlight. We hope you enjoyed this two-part presentation of the presidents of the VCCA. I want to thank Don Williams, Dave Miner, Jim Gephardt, and Franklin Gage, along with the guests of our part one episode, for their time on the podcast and for their service to the VCCA. Each of these members are truly some of the stars of the VCCA. Until next time. Be well, drive safe, and we'll catch you on the back roads. VCCA Spotlight is a production of TKG Media Works on behalf of the Southern California region of the Vintage Chevrolet Club of America. TKG Media Works.